Welcome to this episode of Bounded in a Nutshell. Remember to take a moment to click on the link below to donate to a very special organization. Figure Skating in Harlem is the first organization in the world to combine the power of education with the grace and discipline of figure skating. It is dedicated to developing confidence, leadership, and academic achievement in young girls from low-income backgrounds. The numerous stories of success from its alumni owe a great deal to the unique blend of mentoring and self-expression that is championed by FSH. Remember, no donation is too small or too large to keep the dream alive for these exceptional young girls. Thank you very much. Enjoy the show. To say theater runs in the blood of my next two guests would be an understatement. The daughter of playwright David Rabe and actress Jill Claybaugh nearly made her Broadway debut playing Anil De Soto in Still Magnolias, receiving a Drama Desk Award. Her on and off Broadway credits include Crimes of the Heart, The American Plan Seminar, Much Ado About Nothing, and Merchant of Venice, for which she received a Tony Award nomination for a portrayal of Portia opposite Al Pacino's Shylock. She has appeared in such films as The First, Vice, Fractured, and Midsummer Night's Dream. On television, she's perhaps best known for her multiple complex and nuanced roles in FX horror anthology, American Horror Story, and the portrayal of Claire Bennigan in ABC series, The Whispers. Although we don't share any screen time, I was delighted to find out that Lily will also be appearing in the upcoming Barry Jenkins adaptation of Colson Whitehead's Pulitzer Prize winning novel, The Underground Railroad for Amazon Studios, bringing us one step closer to actually working together. Um, um, according to his mother, the legendary Kristen Linklater, Hamish's birth inspired the title for a highly influential book, Free in the Natural Voice. His on and off Broadway credits include Seminar, The Pain of My Belligerence, Cymbeline, Posterity, Hamlet, Much Ado About Nothing, The Merchants of Venice, and Skull of Lies, for which he won an Obie Award. His film credits include The Fantastic Four, Battleship 42, Midsummer Night's Dream, and the multi-award winning The Big Short. On TV, he is best known for his portrayal of Clap Debussy in Legion, Andrew Kennelly in The Crazy Ones, and Matthew Kimball, opposite Julia Louis-Dreyfus in The New Adventures of in The New Adventures of New Christine. He's due to be seen soon in the television adaptation of possibly my favorite Stephen King book, The Stand. It's a pleasure to have both of you here with us today. It's a pleasure to be had. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for taking time off in these crazy times. Um, so, welcome to Bounded in a Nutshell. Let's start at the beginning. I know we, you know, we know theater runs in your blood, Lily, but um, there was a very, you weren't, always heading towards acting, where you were a dancer, dance instructor. Tell us a little bit about that. I did, uh, I, <laughs> English likes to tease me about 99% of the things that I say, so that's just. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I, I started dancing really at a very young age, like as soon as they would let me take class. We were still living in Manhattan and I loved it. And I think I felt a kind of, you know, it felt I, it felt like something that was my own because my mm -hmm. mother loved the ballet and we always went to the ballet, but she had never danced and my, you know, so it was like, this is something that um, is, is, is mine and felt separate. But I think what I loved so much about it are so many of the things that I love about acting and I love about uh, theater particularly and the discipline and the, um, the connection to your body and being on a stage and telling a story. And um, so I did really love it. I think it was sort of like a roundabout way to get to acting because I probably felt a certain amount of, uh, you know, just shame and trepidation about just like going into the family. Business. Oh? No, that's my tummy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, but anyway, I um, yeah, and and I and I loved writing in uh, you know in school. But then by the time I was in sort of high school, and certainly by the time I was in college, I did start to um, really shift my focus to theater. And, yeah. and it says, and I'm, I'm not sure if this is particularly accurate. There was a the, there was a particular monologue you were asked to do. Was that correct? That really, really was the sort of like cipher for you, you know? 
that is right. I did. I was teaching ballet at like a summer arts camp uh, mm -hmm. in the northwest corner of Connecticut, actually very close to where Hamish grew up. Um, they asked me if I wanted to do something with like, I was in high school and they had a high school program. And so my girls were like, you know, my dancers were like five years old. And so they were in one performance and they said, do you want to do a monologue or something in the, with the high school kids and the acting teacher kind of bullied me a little bit and handed me this monologue and it was Babe from Crimes of the Heart. Mm -hmm. And I did that and yes, I think I felt, not only did I feel hooks then, but um, like a sort of relief and my shoulders were able to drop something about it felt like um, I could. And then I also think there was something about my parents being there and they seemed calm. Like they didn't mm -hmm. really anxious. They didn't, they didn't just go. Oh, yeah. Like, <laughs> <laughs> like, um, and so I felt a kind of permission and whether that actually happened or I just felt a permission from them or from myself, because really my parents were so supportive and mm -hmm. whatever I was gonna do, they were gonna support. But I think they really wanted me to sort of have my own path of discovery. And, and that was like a penny drop kind of nice moment of, not that I was any good at it, it just felt, something about it felt um, like my ship was like the same. I was like, oh, I can go in this direction. And You performed that for five-year-olds? <laughs> <laughs> No, I of course they were appreciative. They just, they just, just <laughs> <laughs> your most captive audience. Um, Hamish, what about you? With um, how 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 did the journey kind of start for you? Um, my mom started company uh, with Tina Packer, and I grew up there uh, uh, in Western Massachusetts. And I would watch the plays, and then they started putting me in the plays. Um, because I would get lost otherwise while they were on stage. And it was a good way of keeping track of me, putting me in tights <laughs> under the lights at a small, at a small size. So um, I grew up at Shakespeare and Company and then uh, started doing, uh, and then moved to New York uh, when I was 19. <laughs> and was it, and you, you said you started doing it and there was probably a, a part of it where they plopped you into, on stage, but was there a certain moment, a bit like Lily, where you just went, actually, it's not just because they're making me do it, but I, I, I really want to do this. I mean, was that early on or was that much later? There's a wonderful bit of apocrypha about me. I'll okay. You right now. Um, uh, that what, the, they did Midsummer Night's Dream. Andrea Herring, I think, is on here. She was uh, Titania. And um, the fairies would all sweep out into the audience, which was this hillside at uh, Edith Wharton's house in, at the Mount. And I was there, and one of the fairies, like the last night, swept me up, and I guess I was four or three or four, and swept me down on stage for a second, pretending I was the changeling child in Oshkosh Bagosh, and then swept me off again. And as soon as I got off stage, I said, I want to do that again. <laughs> There you go. That's okay. <laughs> so, so you guys, uh, so New York uh, came calling and I, I noticed looking at your, your bios and stuff, did you, you, you did a lot of stuff together over the years, your, your paths sort of like crisscrossed and stuff, right? Well, um, you, the, me, her and me? Yeah, yeah. Like uh, the, the, um, a couple of TV shows. I mean, you, not necessarily like on the same episodes, and stuff like that, like uh, you, you sort of like, you came to New York and New York was We did, a, like... I worked with Lily's mom. I did a, a pilot with Lily's mom where she played right. mom uh, and uh, the Eric Gilliland had written and the, it was uh, uh, James Kahn was the stuff. It's very scary, did not go. And <laughs> then, uh, very funny, but did not go and then uh, Jill and I did a uh, Keith Bunin play at Playwrights Horizons called The Busy World is Hushed. So good. And that was probably where Lily and I met. Uh, yeah. But it was hazy. And then um, we did, uh, I mean, I was playing you know, in The Merchant of Venice. Uh, yeah. And so we did that together. But when 
they had made an offer to Hamish and the Merchant of Venice, I was like, oh, mom, it's your friend, Hamish. He has the offer. <laughs> so that was, yeah. And then, but then we, some by design and then some, a lot Dan Sullivan and other things just because we were cast in them. We, we have worked in, primarily in the theater together a number of times, yeah. but then also TV and yeah, and, and movies too. And um, yeah. Right. Yeah, and, and, and now in, in life. Here's a question, Dan Sullivan. I remember at the, <clears throat> I think actors at some point you, in this profession, you sort of need your, your fairy godmother or fairy godfather or someone to put a little bit of magic dust uh, and belief in you, a collaborator. Everyone, at some point in every career, there's always someone that you think was a big part of moving me forward as an artist and stuff like that. And I remember the Shakespeare Society Award where you were, we were being honored and you, you, had a, you, you spoke very deeply and, and gratefully to Dan Sullivan. Can you tell us a little bit about that sort of growth in the theater, especially when you have a director like him guiding you? Do you know what I mean? Um, yeah, I mean, Dan, uh, uh, yeah, how many times, I mean, I've worked with him, I think five or six times, and, um, and uh, he's just really, I mean, I, I couldn't be more, more grateful. He's my, he's like my Shakespeare dad. Um, and, but, but Lily, I mean, your first time acting Shakespeare was... I don't think I would have a life in Shakespeare without Dan Sullivan. Really, I don't. It's, he, he was, he cast me as Portia based on a performance. He had seen her in Heartbreak House and was like, ah, yeah, that's Portia. <laughs> <laughs> and, then, uh, and then she then she had to learn how to act Shakespeare because she hadn't really d uh, done it or spoken it before. I had done like, you know, I went to Northwestern where they do, oh no, but I missed that semester. <laughs> I had a very, but he really was like, it's it, Godfather, fair, all the things. He, he I wouldn't have, um, I, my whole my whole life in Shakespeare is because of Dan, even though he says it can't be true, and but it one hundred percent is the truth. Hamish says something interesting that she that you began to quote unquote act Shakespeare because some of our viewers here, you know, they're coming the different backgrounds of how much acting they've done, how much classical work or not, or whether they want to or not. Just tell us a little bit about what your feelings are about that to say specifically acting Shakespeare at versus other stuff they might have done. What was that like for you, that transition? Well, I think for any, I mean, the, we had, we, we, Hamish was being spoken to in verse. And like <laughs> from I had to learn how to <laughs> not act Shakespeare. It's fair. <laughs> challenge for me was like when, when, when they when they got rid of the verse and the and the beautiful language yeah how what why do well, how do you do that um and it, it, it was a real struggle for a long time but i would say for anyone who if there is anyone which i don't know i feel like a lot of people here probably have um incredibly deep roots in history with shakespeare and experience but if that's not the case with anyone I, I am certainly an example of someone who, um, I, I, it was, I it was a play, like reading Merchant of Venice, it was, I was reading this play, I'd been off, I mean, I knew the play, but it, learning the language and making sense of the language, I wasn't, um, my brain wasn't full of a ton of training. And this is not to say one thing is better than the other, it just wasn't. And so I really was learning on my feet and learning by doing. And I think it's interesting that it was a Shaw play that uh, Dan had seen that gave him whatever confidence that he had that I could play the part. Mm -hmm. um, but it was like the language just made a kind of... I think there's something, there's something, I mean, I, I, I would say about Dan uh, specifically, that's nice in terms of answering this question, which is that he's like, 
your character, you know, the char- it, it's, it's about time. He tells a story first. It's not mm-hmm. like this is Portia's, this is, Por-, you know, there's no, there isn't that sort of weight to um, uh, the process. I think he's really trying to figure out how to tell the story. And, uh, and, uh, and in that way, I think that's actually probably uh, a, a nice original practice, if you will. Like that was, you know, they were, they were good stories at the time that had to be uh, told well and compellingly. And I think not having that huge, you don't have that massive w- weight with Dan when you go in mm-hmm. of a um, of, um, of hundred Hamlets on your hump. And I also, that's Richard but III. I also think <laughs> that like for, I, I, I still have, to have trouble um, articulating myself and finishing <laughs> sentences and I have all these things I want to express and I have all these, and I do feel that Shakespeare, it was like this, it was like suddenly learning a language that allowed me to, as an actress, say all the things I wanted desperately to say, but just wasn't equipped to and didn't yeah. have the words for. And because it was like my virgin experience, really having those words come out of my mouth, and Portia has so many of them, I, I as an actress, I felt like I was, I was really being given... Um, a, a sort of way to communicate uh, mm-hmm. that I didn't, I hadn't been able to co- find um, in that way. And then, and then playing all the, you know, the women that came after it was like, oh, this is just this, they just get, th- this language is, um, it's like having a, a pathway uh, to 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 be able to get all the all the things from your subconscious and your soul out, but it was like a very uh, experience. It was very um, messy and it wasn't like organized. <laughs> because well, like, what I love about watching you do that and, and explain all that is that often uh, we just had John John Lithgow before you was talking about you know, Shakespeare and Lear and stuff like that. But one of the things that is, it always is mind boggling as someone who was, my acting grew with Shakespeare and the Aris and stuff that I was immediately taught that the everything, the verse, the language, that the, the, the specificity of the ideas is all liberating. It's not actually putting you into a corset or tight, you know what I mean? The very things that people often feel worried about, they know, oh God, it's verse. Oh God, those, that line is so complicated. These are, they're not, to constrain you, they're actually to liberate you. They're given, I mean, you know, what you do still better is what is done. I mean, tell that to anyone, you know what I mean? It's like, of course, I want to say that to my partner that everything, it would take me several sentences to say like, you just make everything better. You, you make me happy, but then it just gives you this line. What you do still better is what is done. That's it, you know what I mean? And how to get people, I don't know whether you do a lot of teaching to trust that, He's, he's giving you all the stuff you ever want to say in real life in a weird way. I don't know, Hamish, how you growing up with it, whether you, ex- how you experienced that, you know? Um, yeah, I, I don't, I, it, 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 I mean, it's like Lily saying, you know, it just felt like the, the conversation from off stage just continued to go on on stage. And also, you know, it was a training place uh shakespeare and it is a training place uh and so people are learning how to act but they're also like really learning how to live i mean it's deep there's a lot of shouting um (laughs) and uh and and my mom was the loudest shouter um and uh but it's that's yeah it's a great it's great language but then when i did you know when i going from there and then going to school I mean, just to English, just to like high school English and them mm-hmm. asking me to scan a line, I was like, that doesn't make any, I couldn't do it. I couldn't <laughs> figure out uh, how to, I was like, no, he would say to be or not to be. <laughs> like, the most important thing is that there are the two ideas. I can't stress that. Yeah. Um, that was just the English. Um, but um, uh, that came, 
but then what, what it, it, it's like what you're saying though, when I figured out, I did this, uh, I worked with Peter Hall, um, we mm. did the preparatory season at the Amundsen and he was still doing this John Barton thing, which I think mm. John Barton got over of like doing the breath at the end of the line. Yeah. Uh, not playing the, to the period in terms of yeah. the talk. And, uh, he he just would sit there behind his music stand, Peter Hall, and just like beat it out, beat it out, beat it out. You know, not even look at you, but just tell you where you had fucked up because the <laughs> yeah yeah uh, because the and um, and he was like, but if you do it, it's gonna sound natural, and and it was amazing. Like what and I still do it now, really subconsciously, but I do tend to take my breaths at the end of the line, and. It's, and and it, I still get accused of uh, making uh, of of uh, I don't get accused. Nobody cares. But um, <laughs> but uh, but you know it's it, it does make for a natural. It does make it thought. It does make it emotion. And they are all means to an end. All of these tools that are there. But then you're so happy. You're like, oh man, I've been building that bookshelf forever with my head and actually there's a hammer and nails here that I can pick up too. I mean, both ways make a bookshelf, but mm -hmm. uh, there's, there's tools all over the place. That's what's so wonderful about training. And that's what's so wonderful about, I, I, I also worked with Peter Hall and I remember my audition, it was for the back eye. He didn't look up, up at me once. And I went into the audition saying, I absolutely have to know all my line endings or whatever. Yeah. And I remember at the end of the edition, it, when he, you know, when he offered me the part, he just said, "Very well spoken." Yeah, you know. And people diminish that a bit, like it's like you're not being true to emotional life. But I had a, we had a masterclass with a student doing the Hermione speech, you know, after she's brought up in front the speech, and I had her to say, "Can you just for me?" I called it an exercise. I like you do it all the time. I, I just can't approach verse not doing those things and um i said so just i know it's weird because naturally your natural instinct is to run it to the end of the sentence and the end of the set you know but just take those beats at the end of the line as they say and um she did and it was clearer <laughs> you know and on top of that being forced to take those breaths when she's not yet ready, was doing all the stuff to the diaphragm that needs to be done to make her uncomfortable. And oh yeah, remember that backstory we told you about just giving birth? You don't have to stress yourself trying to act giving birth. I can hear it and I will then see it. Do you know what I mean? And trying to get people to believe, uh, to trust in that sort of, it's really, but then you're right. You, you said earlier, Hamish, about on Shakespeare and yourself or TV and film, you kind of have to let that go though don't you like when you're doing should we say quote unquote i hate this word naturalistic because i find shakespeare as naturalistic as anything but when you're doing film and tv what's that what's that other approach like for you you know i mean lady you you didn't really do a ton of shakespeare and then try and come back to film you were sort of doing it together at the same time your theater and film and tv so it was probably not as much an issue for you but i'm just that that question is specifically to hamish about going from that classical world with that looking at lines in a certain way into film and, and TV. Uh, yeah, the first time I got a uh, TV, it took me a while to get a TV or movie job. Uh, <laughs> I moved to New York um, and uh, I did uh, uh, in my first take, I remember my first take in front of the camera in, in my first uh, movie role and the guy came up and he was like, I think you have to do something. Uh, I was <laughs> I need you to do something because I was so determined not to do to anything. Do anything. Just think. <laughs> I don't think I'll move. My mom said, you move. You know, move. I was just thinking. It's like it really does. It looks like you've fallen asleep. Sleep. Yeah. You say action. <laughs> um, so it's been tricky. But uh, uh, I found, you know, I, for me, um, I, I get very stressed and worried about it, but just knowing that there aren't really hard and fast rules. And I think, you know, it's been great to get to work with Dan and to have someone where you know are and you can get the sort of the liberation from that. But I think it's also so wonderful to work with all different sorts of 
directions because that's how you're going to get stretched. That's how you're going to uh, find. And also, it's just changing all the time. I mean, yeah. uh, what was an acceptable Hamlet five minutes ago is just Not so the- boring. Uh, nah. So, you know, it's like really exciting that that keeps shifting. For I got this friend who sending, keeps sending me uh, quarantine hamlets. I mean, sending me in quarantine hamlets from YouTube. And you're just like, you know, these are like the great hamlets, and but they're on a screen, so it's not yeah, the yeah, yeah, yeah. But like, you know what? The most recent one is the one I'm most excited to see. It's yeah. the most, everything teaches you something or is interesting. and stuff, But it's just like, it keeps rushing ahead of you. And I think yeah. uh, uh, acting wise, what's, what's, What about you, Lily? I mean, the the whole, I mean, I, I share that whole thing of you come from theater and you come to film and you just say, do less. And then you're, a, you're like, you're just staring at the screen. Was that the bouncing between both worlds? Did that come pretty straightforward to you or did, was it major adjustments for you? I think the hard, the hardest part was just, and, and I feel this is shifting now too, uh but i i always it was the hard it was so hard when i was able to play the parts i was playing on stage uh and have the language that i had on stage that sometimes certainly not all the time but um you know in with a lot of film and tv it just felt like there was so much there was so much less, there was so much less for the women, there was so much, you know, and and, um, and I do think that is shifting for mm-hmm. women also. I think there's just like such incredible and, uh, you know, working with Barry and that writing and having, mm-hmm. the, I mean, it's sort of a great example of where it felt like the roof kept opening up, the ceiling kept opening up and there was more and more and more, which is always how it feels doing a great play and not yeah. always, Bill's doing certain uh, TV. Certain yeah. TV. Yeah. Now I remember yeah. Barry. Barry actually saying coming up to me when we were filming, he says, "You know, we were doing this one of those scenes because he writes. He's a poet when he writes, and he writes. And uh, this scene was the, was the length of the Bible. I felt like I was speaking for the length of the Bible. And he just came up and said, why do you think I hired you? Because you do theater. And he's like, you know, it's changing where that world's been." embraced in in the writing also right yes i i think and, and and as a woman also i feel like you know there there are you're one, getting to say that much <laughs> you yeah. know it's like yeah, yeah. There too. but but that was sort of always the the bummer of it was like you know it was like when i i i know how to ski and then i tried to snowboard and i was like sitting on my butt <laughs> i had like a bruised butt and i was on like the bunny hill yeah, yeah. Uh, and I was like, I can ski this whole mountain, and so then sometimes it felt like that going from mm-hmm. uh, going from theater to to the uh, film or TV, but it, it it less so, and you know, it is it's so lucky to go back and forth, and they inform each other so wonderfully, and but there's yeah. nothing like there's just nothing like doing it. Here, so here's my question now with the work. I'm one of those people, and my wife will attest to this. I can't even do self tapes, emotional self tapes with her. Like, I'm like, I can't do this scene with you. I can't tape with you. <laughs> Yo, I know you. I mean, how is it? We have to do a tape later to write up. I'm supposed, yeah, I have to do it. Ta- be honest about the self taping situation. <laughs> it's not good. How is it as your partner? Like, tell me honestly, is it just it's me? Good. It's not good. <laughs> it's not good to do it. Yeah. I, I, I hate, I hate, I hate it. I hate, I hate taping, uh, I hate taping Lily, but the only thing I hate worse is asking her to tape me. I, it's just like, oof, no. You don't want to go to, I mean, no. But then again, you've done, so what is, what is the, I mean, I've, I've said to Andrew, I said, I really don't think we should do a show together. I love you dearly, but I don't think we should do a show together because I, I've seen how it is with taping. So what is it that you can go and give us, you know, your much ado? The first time I saw you guys perform was actually Much Ado About Nothing. And it was absolutely breathtaking and set a real bar for, because I was coming in straight after to do Leah. And I'm not just saying that because you're a guest. And 
it was just the back and forth was just so natural and you fell in the audience you did that thing which we as an audience don't realize we want we don't actually want to see you doing the work for us we want to fall in love for you you know and it's beautiful so but how do you then work together in parts like this you did cymbeline together you did that together did you do a romeo and juliet together no am i making that up we I'm making did, that up we did the balcony scene at like a gala that's the one but yeah. yet you can't self-tape what's that all about I think it's embarrassing. <laughs> uh, I think it's just like it's it's just like what I mean. For me, it's because the, an audition is like trying to get a job. It's like just that neediness, which is so humiliating and so anti whatever. And I know that that's not what you're doing when you're making it audition. You're really it's like your chance to act probably for that for the day or for the week or for whatever um and so you should embrace it and but uh but then having your partner watch you want to get a job that both of you secretly know is gonna be going to or to for grace um <laughs> like it's then you're that was good honey that was, that was good that was great good. yeah that was good it was really fun. I don't mind it. I'm like, let's do another. Do you want me to do another one? How how can I help? And Hamish just won't. I won't talk to her for the rest of the day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was garbage. No, it was garbage. You know it was garbage. I should have worked harder. That's the other thing, is it's like the laziness. They know your your level of, of commitment. And yeah. so why didn't why didn't you get off? I mean, like Lily. Why your book yet? Yeah. Yeah, Lily will. Lily will say, "Let's do it again. Let's do it again. Can I? Can we just run the lines? Can we run the lines just one more time?" And and she'll be like, "No, I that semicolon was a total, total <laughs> colon. Let's go again." And I'm like, "Oh, I hate you so much." And then I'll do it, and I'll be like, and then he says something about feelings, <laughs> and I'll get it, and she's. she's and uh, uh, never mind. I just need to say it out loud. <laughs> so, is that um, there are a lot of uh, he, here's the question I always ask people because a lot of people coming on the show are considered as quote unquote established, you know, whatever that means. Let's not talk about starting off, let's talk about when you'd had a couple of things under your belt that were had put you out there, right? Were there periods of not having things under your belt with the periods of like wise and you know tell us about the i i my allegory for it is tell us about the bits between the pictures in the album not just the smiley bits were there times of struggle even after you had quote unquote made your big splash or anything like that tell us well good we'll get a story each from you then <laughs> and also how you navigate through that you know, because uh, apart from COVID, you know, there are people, there are, some of our viewers are just starting off. Some of us are trying to get started off. Some of us have started and things have slowed down. I mean, John Lithgow, just before you were saying how he, he almost took an artistic director, director job, you know, because he directed in the, when things went suddenly quiet, you know, there are other conversations people have with themselves about why should I be doing this? What else can I be doing? You know, and I just, Wondered, it's important that we all know that happens that can happen at the beginning, but it, I think it's important to know that it's all relative. It can happen any time, and it's it's relative the degree of it. You know, I, I remember doing a, a play with you know lovely Kira Knightley. Uh, it was her first play, and this is Kira Knightley in every big blustered Pirates of the Caribbean. But I remember her coming into rehearsal one day a bit down because she'd lost out to someone that was already at, she was only about 23 at the time, but someone already was being named the next year. Do you know what I mean? The craziness of this business. So can we just tell about the, the, rea the fact that that's a very universal thing that goes and how you navigated through it, your version of it? Go ahead. I was gonna, uh, you know, uh, this is like, my mother who um, was an actress and had all, you know, such a sort of, in her career and so much of her career and her sort of, sort of booming parts of her career were before I was uh, even a thought. Mm -hmm. but, um, 
a lot of what she did, you know, she, she sort of turned away from work to raise us by choice. But then I also watched her finding her way back into it, finding her way back to the theater and all of the, um, you know, and, and I really do feel like when I think about her greatest kind of actor gift to me, it was about um, finding ways to be happy in your life when you, in the, in the spaces in between, yeah. working because they're inevitable, they're going to happen and they should happen because if you go from job to job, even if you have the luxury of going from job to job mm. to job, um, I think there is a risk of missing some of life that then can make you, you know, and we, and I, and I don't mean in any way the luxury of we, we all have to make a living and we all, but, but that those spaces in between, uh, she really, I remember, you know, especially once I was kind of starting out, she was like, always look at them as an, as an opportunity um, to, so I, I do feel like Hamish crawls up the, it's not that I am easy with, you know, periods of time with not working. I have anxiety about it and all of the rest, but I do feel like, um, I'm, you know, I'm grateful and I hope I can pass on to my children to just, uh, find as much, as much joy as possible in those, in those unknown periods. And they really, really do. I don't have a friend. I have friends who are at like the top, top, you know, getting five offers. And the same thing as Kira Knightley. They still are missing out on the job they really want or feel yeah. or worried about their age or worried about the, you know, whatever it is. So it's like, um, yeah, just, just finding, finding those things, whether it's, whatever it is, the, the, the people mm -hmm. in your life and those touchstones and family and uh, Hamish may disagree with everything I'm saying because work is the <laughs> only thing that matters. <laughs> what's, 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 your, what's your appeal thoughts? What are your thoughts on that, Hamish? I'm just looking at Ode, Ode on Melancholy. Mm. Uh, uh, Peace, my yeah. favorite. Yeah. Uh, but um, I just wouldn't know the, I only know the first one, which is, uh, uh, no, no, go not to Lethe. I think it's really important. You don't go to Lethe. You don't get, you know, erase your brain. All the down times, that's the juice. That's where you're going to play all the characters that we would want to see on a stage or in a movie or a thing, you know, the yeah. people who, um, uh, the, 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 the people who are as sad as we can be. Um, so, uh, you know, it's really useful. Those first years living in New York uh, before I started to get uh, more work um, were, yeah, there was really, it's really, it really sucks. It's really hard. Mom used to say this thing to her students, which was, you got to give New York 10 years. You got to give it um, that much time for all the different cycles of business to go through, for your look to be the look, for you to get the experience, for you to get tough enough, for you to get vulnerable enough, for you to get all those different things that'll give you, you know, for luck to g forget today to ignore you. And um, <laughs> all those sorts of things. Uh, and I think you really got to give New York uh, two lifetimes probably more than that. I mean, it's like there's so much stuff outside your control, but the way I would deal with my anxiety or tell myself was the healthy way to deal with my anxiety when I wasn't working was to do absolutely everything I could do. Mm -hmm. You know, give luck its best opportunity for uh, shining its light on you that day uh, or someday in the future, you know? So you go to your open calls at the equity building and you do send out your postcards back in the day. Uh, when you work on your comic and your tragic monologue, oh. <laughs> uh, and um, and uh, and just do absolutely everything. But I, the, and then you know, and then you start working, and then you're like, why can't I keep working? And I I just I basically I had like a kind of like I I saw an astrologer that Lily made me go to see, and the astro this was like ten years ago, and uh, the, the, you know there were some good things, there were some bad things. The worst thing. The only takeaway I had from like this two hour session was that I wasn't going to work for a whole year in my 40s. Didn't mention that there would be a pandemic, that there would yeah. be a lot of people not working, but I was just like throwing, yeah. throwing up everything. I was like, can you imagine? 
a year. Yeah. What could possibly occur that? Um, but I actually pre prior to uh, everything going terrible in the world in a real way, um, I wasn't working a lot uh, this past year, and it was kind of like a year without work, and I and it was so depressing and I don't know how to do and all my wise words that I give to everybody but myself they would not apply to myself and I just find it it's really um hard but but it's not bad for it to be hard it's only mm -hmm. as bad as the badness is um uh, I mean which means that it is hard when it's bad <laughs> so is that um uh Let's talk about specifically about what I saw you in and what you do about nothing and how you approach, you know, there's always a weight. I always feel there is a weight. You have to somehow cleanse yourself of it and shower yourself out of it. Is When you're playing a role, you know two-thirds of the audience have seen at least once, have their opinions about it. You know what I mean? And also, it's almost worse when people expect you to be good at it, does that make sense? So how do, you, how do you cleanse the palate? How do you, I'll just throw this out as what I'm sort of looking for in the question. I almost turned down playing Romeo because my impression of Romeo was from what I had seen or I felt this character was without once having ever read Romeo and Juliet. Once I read it, after I almost turned down the other, I fell in love with Romeo. I was like, oh, this isn't what I've seen before. <laughs> you know what I mean? So in your process of doing a Benedict, you know, Beatrice, you know, Portia, what is your, what, what's, your, what's your sort of like step one, step two, step three to getting into that, into that character and shedding the weight of expectation as it were, you know? Yeah, or those speeches. Yeah. <laughs> that everyone knows. You did know. this incredible thing with, and I, I, you know, I, it had to be, I'm sure he would sort of brush it off like it wasn't all uh, part of his master plan, but I think it had to be where we didn't rehearse the trial scene for ages. And I mean, like we, and we had, the, it was when they were doing rap, you know, there were those few summers yeah. of the rap, the yeah. rehearsal period was much longer and you'd have days off and but it was like weeks and weeks and then we would get to the trial scene and like oh we've just run out of time and the day is over and it was it was so because so many of the things and the Portia speech and and Portia and Shylock yeah coming to, it's the only scene we have in the play yeah um but it was like by the time we actually got to that and all of the things that you know were like had were built up you know these like mountains these impossible mm -hmm. the the ground was he had like laid down all the tracks of the play so that by the time we actually did say the words of the trial. I think we said, you know, we said them in the first table read mm. and like a month later, <laughs> finally saying these words. And it was like the tracks had all been laid Maybe. down. There was no quicksand. And so then you were able to just, and I remember the first time Al looked at me. It was like the, we hadn't made eye contact. And even though we, you know, um, but it was like everything that there was no quicksand, the, the ground was solid and then you could say, so that I, again, I'm just crediting Dan to sort of, he, he then by doing that with the future parts that I played that felt um, like there are those moments and those Rosalind moments, whatever they are, less so with mm -hmm. Cymbeline. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, these one, you just know that everybody is thinking like, oh, here comes this scene, here comes this yeah, moment. Yeah. Uh, I just would really try to remember how that felt in that process of uh, almost, it was like you were so ready, you were so tired of waiting that then the, it just felt inevitable to say the thing that you were going to say. Right. And the noise around it just was so much quieter. 
And that's funny because that's quintessentially the whole idea of need, the need to speak in Shakespeare. Do you know what I mean? You've just explained in a sort of bigger way the moment to moment need to say what you have to say. And so how you sort of manifest that during the rehearsal process in a way. Yeah. Help eclipse the anxiety. Yeah you know, and the weight of the fame of the thing, because you're like, I really, I've been waiting that I have to say. I have to say this, I wanted to, yeah. What about you, Hamish? Um, and, uh, and you, you have the special, I don't want to use the word weight, because I think, I mean, just the time I spent with your mom was just so enlightening, but you do have the legacy of being Hamish Linklater, uh, Kristen Linklater's son, who should know this stuff, and people expect that you breathe, eat, and make your phone orders in Shakespeare or something. But <laughs> it's like, just, but was there, do you, did, did that in any way add to you expect your sort of like demands on yourself on playing these big roles that are so well known? God, I didn't feel nervous about it until now. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, don't fuck it up. Yeah. Um, <laughs> no, I mean, I think my mom did a really good, was a real good stage mom for some for somehow because it was probably like probably all I really cared about was what she thought and then she was always sort of disappointed so then <laughs> there was nothing else really. and then at some point she was like oh oh you got it and uh, uh you figured it out or something that was different from I think I did start I I don't know but every time that her teachers are there every time there's a link with her hi Andrea Every time there's a link theater teacher in the house, I definitely seize up and sometimes will like literally lose my voice because there's, there's watchers there, there's witnesses there. Um, but uh, uh, otherwise, otherwise the other people I don't, you know, uh, the, the, yeah, the voice thing is interesting, but otherwise the, the roles, um, I learned so many good Romeo tricks, which I didn't even know that they were tricks or different ways in from watching the Romeos that I grew up with at Shakespeare and Company. And then mm -hmm. uh, people from Shakespeare and Company would come and see me in a thing and they'd be like, oh yeah, you ripped that off from, Peter <laughs> oh, that's John Haddon or that's what, and I would be like, I no, that's just how you play the, I didn't know, that's how you say those words. That's how they, but I was ripping off everybody else's um, stuff that came before. <laughs> And I did not have a good time playing Romeo. I mean, I, I played Romeo twice and that was so lucky and I got to do it two times in a row. And it was all that I wanted to do growing up was be mm -hmm. Romeo on that balcony. Um, and, and then I really, I didn't, I didn't, I, I didn't, I, it was a really like a, a bit of a letdown for me. And I have a friend out here uh, who really loved playing Romeo and I actually really loved playing Hamlet and didn't grow up with a lot of Hamlets at Shakespeare and Company because it was outside and that's more of an interior play. And, yeah. uh, and so a lot of that stuff, I felt like, uh, I don't know. I, I think like that part is such a weird thing to figure out the navigation, how to navigate it, mm -hmm. that um, worrying about how somebody else had done. I mean, Rogan Peasant Slave, I think is hard. But uh, that one, I would always be like, "Ooh, this is why." Great. Why that one in particular compared yeah, to? Uh, just like because it's so great and it's yeah. so, like uh, such a. There's so many chapters in that speech. Yeah, There's so many. Yeah. That, you know, if you get it, I mean, it's really one where you hate yourself more if you get it right at the end because you know you can't repeat it. Then yeah. Uh, but but that I didn't. I have, I, I, I just, I find that these parts now are such a joy to play. There's such a, <laughs> um, uh, you know, it's just like, it's, uh, I, I, no, nobody gets to take that away. So, yeah. you, you know. I think, I, I mean, just going, I remember, um, it's funny you're right because there's some there's something and you know lily you should do hamlet at some point i think it's getting to that point where we'd love to see <laughs> but it's something that there's the expectation i just remember brana talking about when he did hamlet and just when he was about to do to be or not to be it felt like everyone in the audience was just ahead of him about to say it before he did so i get it but it's so weird because i i i, I kind of agree with you hamish in that for some reason 
I did in Hamlet, which is arguably the greatest of all. And I feel it is the best thing I've ever played, best character I've ever played. I didn't feel that weight with him because there's something so incredibly individual, individual about your Hamlet that, that everyone always, it's, it's, I hate to say, it's almost like doing James Bond. It's like everyone wants to know what your, your Hamlet is. You know what I mean? It's almost foolproof, you know? Go on, go on. But, uh, but I would say also, yeah, it's totally full, it's totally personal. It's gonna be every, so it's, yeah, you can't fuck up Hamlet, but, uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, but the great thing I did it, I cheated at some point, I listened to every single recording I could get of every single one of the soliloquies. And I, w and I went through, I got like a lot of the radio. I got, and I listened to uh, from all these different periods um, and I gotta tell you, they kind of all sound the same. <laughs> um, I mean, yeah, there's this, there's that, but, um, and, and there's a wonderful book of Hamlet, uh, uh, modern Hamlets and their soliloquies where you go through like about 10 of the great ones from the past century and you see all their different, you know, and Ben yeah. Kingsley walking out during uh, Rogue and Penn's Slave and you think the plays, yeah. you know, all that sort of stuff. Yeah. It's still, you know, it's still gonna kind of, they're, they're, it's the same, and and that's comforting, you know. Yeah. These guys, you know, these guys and these ladies too. Hopefully, Lily, really. um, you know, <laughs> God, Lily's Hamlet. Yeah, you just thought about that. That just dropped in it. <laughs> I think like Rosalind, there's a real. That was the first with where, and it's not. I mean, yeah, but you really think because I had seen. I certainly seen other Rosalinds and, but you do feel in the, and I, it's my, it, I sort of imagine it's like the closest experience I've had to playing Hamlet just in yeah. terms of having, uh, not to compare them, but. The weight like, of. Say, you, you're like, oh, this, I actually can't, I can't hide myself. I can't really even make a choice because yeah. this is just going to be my soul revealing itself however good, bad, ugly, messy, otherwise that is, there's no yeah. way to say the words yeah. apart, honestly, mm -hmm. without that happening. So it will yeah. be mine. And, yeah. and like Hamish is saying, maybe in a recording of 10 of them lined up, it might sound, but I know that it was like really the first time that thing of you're this, you're, you're, you're yeah. you know, that I was like, oh, there's no, there's actually no way around it if you say the words. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I totally agree. And the, something you mentioned was the joy of, of, of saying the words. I, I remember being exhausted before the beginning of the play, exhausted at, 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 you know, the half hour. And then you say, you know, so that this too, too suck. And then you go, oh, now I have that to say. And then you start going, oh no, I still, and then I still have to say there's a special, limit. you know, you're, you're just excited about, it's sort of the joy of saying that stuff. Um, find something in you that you sort of forget about yourself, I guess, you know. Um, is there something on, on, the, on, the, on, the, on the bucket list? Is there a wish list right now? Is there a couple of characters you guys would love to tackle before too long? Any of them, all of them, the ones we've done again. At this point, I would be <laughs> never been, uh, I've never missed it more and I've missed it a lot, but my mm -hmm. God. Um, yeah. Have you done that? Go on. No, but I mean, you've got, yeah, because you've, you've, she's just got, she's just got the, um, Twelfth night to go for her for her major lady uh, uh, earlier. Then there's the sort of the gap. Yeah. And, well, uh, Winter's Tale is that. Great. Winter's Tale. Hermione. Yeah. It's a great. Yeah. Story. Yeah, but yeah. She's boy parts. Boy parts. I let. I mean, yeah. I've only not, and all the girls I've played, except for Beatrice, have been pants parts, yeah. boy parts. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, but now I'd like to just wear pants the entire time. <laughs> <laughs> what about you, Hamish? Is that what's what's? Have you done the Scottish play yet? Have you? No. Uh, 
Uh, no, I mean, uh, yeah, I'd really like to do Richard the Third. I'd mm. really like to. I got to do Prin Prince Hal at forty, which was, he was embarrassing, so amazing. but I loved it. This so was in, in uh, this was a Tom Hanks, right? For yeah, Tom yeah. Hanks playing Thanks. full stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Joe Morton was uh, Henry, and um, and I mean, they're old, so I guess. But Hamish okay looked was... twenty. He really did look not twenty. In, not in the pictures. <laughs> uh, <laughs> got the pictures. When, when the sun went down uh, <laughs> but uh it was that was so fun and that was also one writing but like and the, yeah so you know all of them henry five would be awesome uh but R richard richard would be so fun um it's so weird because i've been I've, for some reason i don't know what's maybe with what we're watching daily on the news but i've been really thinking about richard a lot <laughs> do you know what i mean the sort of the the guy and and the public versus private and all that stuff like that has really been circulating i think it's in the air it's probably going to be one of those you know when for some reason every theater is doing the same play like everyone has the same idea at the same time i feel that's one that's coming up you know but yeah but i mean but when like yeah. uh, Wait, don't, don't we have to go back to Shakespeare? I mean, don't, isn't the only safe place to do Shakespeare now is outside with outside. squared off on the lawn? Six yeah. Feet. Everyone gets their blanket and you can't get off the blanket. You get the middle <laughs> of the blanket where you're, and then it's all spread out there. Yeah. And uh, everyone has to blow kisses at each other. I read some theaters like that they don't, that they can't program kissing or sword fighting plays. No. Yeah, that's I, crazy. Or, I mean, that's sort of like takes, or, or, <laughs> that's pretty much us done. We're done. So, <laughs> <laughs> we're sort of done. It'd be like Zoom chats every day because that's all we're doing. <laughs> so how are you doing? I'm good. How are you doing? Um, uh, we're sort of at the point now, Michelle, are we right at the point where we can think of opening up to questions from some of our listeners to these two? Yeah, definitely. Great. Okay, uh, so this question is from Sophia, and I know we've talked a little bit about Much Do already, um, but they, Sophia wanted to know, what did you learn about the characters in the process, and what surprised you? Well, I, I mean, uh, what, you know, it was hard for us to convince some people that it was a good idea to do it with us as young as being young. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, we're really looking forward to doing it again when we're even, when we're older. <laughs> but uh, like there was, uh, I mean, there was, it was something real nice about, uh, do, do, uh, about them, I mean, about them being uh, in their thirties or, <laughs> Yeah, the world must be people. Yeah, mm -hmm. like yeah. Uh, it, uh, so that was that. That was interesting. I had I had done it. I had done it in high school like a couple of times, and I was so excited uh, to and and to climb and clamber around and uh, do all the sort of fun things that I remembered from high school. And then, but all I can really remember from it was like standing on the stage with Lily, like, and it feeling like we were totally alone across the stage, just like really giggling um, <laughs> because it was raining, because I'd screwed up a line, because uh, her hair was doing something fun in the breeze. Uh, but it really, uh, there was something really uh, in, in, intimate and public about it. Uh, which was, I think, su more surprising th than I expected. But there was also, and Hamish will cringe for sure. I just said something so cringy. I just <laughs> <laughs> you can let out all the cringe cows now. <laughs> but it was like really loving someone and really knowing someone, and then saying kind of what you were saying earlier. How we, you know, we can f try to find these ways of expressing our love to the people we love in the world, but saying those things that they say to one another and having these witnesses, uh, yeah. it was like, it was so uh, painful. It was so <laughs> amazing. <laughs> it yeah. was so, because there was, uh, it was like, 
it really, um, I, I like Jack during that scene, I just, he would just, we would, there was so much crying in rehearsal mm -hmm. over that scene uh, because uh, it's so simple what they say and yet it's the best possible. Uh, so I, anyway, I can imagine certainly people playing those parts and falling in love, but I already loved him. Mm -hmm. And I was saying these things and it was like, um, that was really special. One of the, well, I mean- so he, he can't look at you right now because he'll yeah, break down if he makes eye contact with you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Great. Good. All right, next question. Okay, next question. This is from Colby. Uh, do you remember a moment you had to level up your commitment as an actor? What sacrifices, changes did you have to make in terms of discipline to have a real career versus a few gigs? I mean, I think, uh, honestly, I think that change, that's always like, you know, whether it's like, do I need to get rid of this? You know, it, it, there, you're making these choices like all the time. Like, what, what, what new? What's what? that? I don't know. It's like, well, I was going to say something about filler or, <laughs> uh, you know, the roots that are coming in. Uh, you know, you do. I think there are like, you're making these choices all the time, which are going to give you a better opportunity to get the next job, hopefully but you're also hopefully always hanging on to the fact that what makes you you is what they really want to hire and uh uh you can't lose that if you're one card in the 52 game of pickup you know game of 52 pickup then it's going to take 52 tries maybe to find you but if you're face up and you're your own yourself you know you got to hang on to that um mm -hmm at the same time. But you know, I'll get my teeth whitened. And uh, <laughs> uh, well, it's happened once and it was very painful. And then I didn't actually work for six months. So <laughs> uh, that was so, the moral of the story is just be you as much as you can because it clearly doesn't work. <laughs> I mean, like making the same self tapes, like yeah. do the extra tape. Do the thing, yeah. And also the relief in, I don't know if you, you're probably never ever lazy, but I feel- No, like, I can be lazy. I feel <laughs> like no matter, I, I'm always reminded that being lazy never ever feels, it's never worth it. Yeah. Like showing up to the day and, you know, sort of saying, I just didn't want, whatever. It's always better. And it just feels so much better to know that you've done the work. work. Yeah. That's great. I think that becomes more and more, that becomes more and more the case. Uh, yeah. That actually, I think your anxiety, uh, for me, I'm much older than Lily, but for me, uh, as it <laughs> goes by, my anxiety about not being, not having worked hard enough goes up and, uh, all the time. And uh, you would think you would get sort of like more confidence. But is that, is that when you say it goes up or that? Because I know I fall into the trap of only thinking I haven't worked hard enough after the fact. Is it actually a genuine, I haven't worked, knowing it as you go into the meeting or whatever, or is it one of those, if the meeting didn't go so great or you didn't the game, you start second guessing yourself. Do you know, you have to be careful of that also, don't you? Because yeah. I know I do that to myself, you know? I feel like you know, like you know what, it, when you, when I have not <laughs> prepared enough, I do know going in, or when I really have and then it doesn't go well, I. And it feels so much better when I can after, you know, I, I can say to myself, but I did do, but then when you, when you didn't, yeah. it feels, it's like a double down on how bad. Yeah. It. Yeah. Um, I find, I find it easier to let go of the ones I know I was totally prepped for. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because it's harder to find the reason why you didn't get it, you know, and right. stuff. Yeah. And yeah. Like it goes into the wind and, but. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Next question, Michelle. Next question is from Sarah, who's a director. Um, she says, you both mentioned directors you have loved working with and the freedom you have gained during those processes. 
what is it about those collaborators that you wish every director would bring to the I, I, I thought the question was going to go, now name some of the bad ones <laughs> <laughs> who restricted you and made you feel comfortable. Their names you can do that there. too. <laughs> Uh, what was what 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 the, the, the commonality of the things that you love about the directors that you love the most? I I I mean I'll say that I find, you know I well I don't know I think a lot of good directors uh, first of all they cast their shows well so they know how to direct the actors that they cast but they also are flexible and they direct different actors differently I mean I think you know, Dan will deal with me and Lily in different ways. Uh, and uh, basically, I think a director who makes an ensemble that is happy on stage together, uh, as an audience member, when I see a cast that is into each other, that's my best experience as an audience mm -hmm. member. And uh, so I think uh, that kind of team building is, is good. Um, for a certain kind of show, you know, if you're doing something with a lot of projections where you have to just stand very, very still, um, then you might, the, a different director's sensibility might be required. I also so appreciate, and, and really in theater and in film, TV, someone who definitely, you know, I, I'm always like, please just have, have an opinion. Your opinion. Getting in your, you know, have an opinion. But then know that it's when that when that person with the strongest, clearest opinion comes up and says, I, I was wrong. Mm -hmm. I gave you yes. bombs. I was wrong. Yeah. That that in no way diminishes your you. yeah. feeling of I will still follow you. I will still yeah. it's it, it, if anything, it, you know, it does the opposite for me. It's like yeah. I so I'm I'm always so thrilled when someone um and then, has that real confidence but then also like without any kind of there's you know they're like oh and that isn't working because then also as an actor you can do the same and you can try the thing that then and then go well that was let's not do that again or i'm you know um it just there's so much freedom in that the true genius directors though are the ones who make you think every choice was yours is yours yeah you know, that yeah. you built the performance yourself in spite yeah. of because if it's your performance, if it's the actor's performance that they have built, then they will perform that performance night after night with gusto. And, yeah. You know. I always find my, my, my favorite directors are the ones people, when people ask me, how was it working with them? I go, I can't actually remember the notes they gave me. They were clearly guiding me, clearly. And like you say, I, I, was, I said very early in this, I can't remember whether it was Richard Ed that said it or Sam Mendes, but they say 90% of their work is done in casting. So they cast the people, they put them in there and all that. But it's often very hard for the directors. I really, the ones I would go, you know, go back to every single time. And it's really hard to know, remember when they directed and came and whatever, but clearly they were doing it one way or another, whether it was, you know, so that's always interesting. Anyway, Michelle, next question. Uh, yeah, next question. This is from Edward. Can you talk about your experience working together to open seminar on Broadway back in 2011? Did you find your experience with Shakespeare translate well to the very language? What was that? To, to what language? To what language? Contemporary. Oh. Um. Yeah, I mean, that was really, that was such a wonderful experience. Also, uh, well, because, yeah, it was like, it was like this new play and it was a play about rewriting where there was a playwright that was rewrite. I mean, the play was about like a, 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 a writing seminar where Alan Rickman is ripping you apart for your writing. And then he was also like uh, we were all like trying to, and so it was, it was like such a process play uh, about process. Um, I, yeah, I, 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 but the language and, the, and Teresa's language is so funny. 
and so fast. And um, it, it, it was really nice. Our, our scenes that we got, we got these scenes of just like hanging out together that uh, where the behavior almost became its own uh, sort of uh, verse, verse movement stuff. Uh, it was really, it was a real special experience. Hamish was also, that was like the, I had only done, I guess maybe in college, but like in professionally, I had only done mostly plays that were, I don't think I'd ever done a play without an intermission. <laughs> I don't think I'd ever worn jeans. Um, and, uh, it, you know, we were like, yeah, we were out of the play, like came down at 920 or something. <laughs> like normally when you're, you know, a third of the way through. But Hamish, I had, you know, in the past, so much of what I did, uh, how I dealt with my nerves was to really control my life. And I would constantly, and this is something Kristen has then also uh, given me, <laughs> really schooled me about, but I was constantly putting myself on vocal rest and I wouldn't eat dairy and I would never go out with the cast after. And I would, you know, I was like, this is the only way to be. And Hamish was like, uh, <laughs> what do you go, this is, you go to dinner, you go to the bar, you have wings, you have whatever, you have the ranch dip. It's not <laughs> gonna change your performance. You can, you can live your, you can live your life. And so it was like, I really felt, that was the first play I ever did where I, um, truly where I had an experience of like community with the cast after. Mm -hmm. But that was also Alan too. I mean, yes. uh, Alan Rickman would, would, would not go straight home on vocal rest. No. No, but you really do learn, and it, it's everyone's comfort and you have to, but I was, it was a great, and I thank Hamish, and also Sam Gold was, was, was tough on me about that too. Um, you know, that like letting go of that, it's just an illusion that you're mm -hmm. somehow controlling your performance by controlling your life. Mm -hmm. um, and that you can, you know, you I've, I've always found that really yeah. one of the big, big, big differences in coming to do theatre here was having pretty much grown up doing theatre at the RSC and National England, that old school thing of, of course you go out for a drink. Right. I mean, not just even one. I mean, I remember, you know, starting out at the RSC and the guys playing the leads were basically passing out in the ditch somewhere the night before, turning up for the rehearsal, <laughs> warming up and whatever, and giving the most electric performances ever. I'm not saying go to that extreme, but that sort of preciousness is really, it's, 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 it's really weird because I think that puts a, you're subconsciously putting a pressure on yourself also, you know? I, because I always find it's difficult to answer a question when someone asks about my process, because sometimes my process is like, I kind of just learned the lines and, you know, got loose and, came on and saw what the other person was doing and then played with them. Do you know what I mean? I, I didn't go to the, you know, Bronx Zoo and watch a friggin' lizard dance to get my movement. You know what I mean? I just, you know, um, sorry, yeah. Hamish, you're gonna say no, something. But I, I just think it is a balance, uh, an ever shifting balance between Pilates and bl blackout alcoholism. <laughs> <laughs> and you, you have to, I mean, because the, you're ultimately you're playing human beings. Yeah, yeah. As a human being. Yeah, and it does know? depend on the role, but it was a great, but that was like a, you know, uh, that, that was really a big shift. An open, an eye opener for you, great. Um, I think time for like two more questions, uh, Michelle. Yep, okay. So this question is for both of you from Taj. What is the challenge in unraveling the character at the end of each day, or do you prefer to keep them going through the whole Like, kind of goes back to what you guys were just talking about, too. <laughs> you know, it's, uh, that's, yeah, because the, now there's like, uh, uh, people do all these vocal warm downs now, which are so great, um, where it's not just doing your warm up, but you warm down after a show, which is, uh, so smart. And I think that's also depends on the character. There are some parts where you don't, where your character doesn't get to finish the night, you know, and that's so hard, but where you're like, you don't get the catharsis. You don't get the, you know, like I can't imagine being Malvolio and just being like, 
I'll be revenged on you and you storm off. I mean, it's just like, there's no end for that guy. Um, and so I think the parts are, uh, sometimes you're like, oh, I'm done, I'm dead. And Horatio just uh, got the sweat out of my eye. And that's wonderful, you know? Um, but uh, in some parts, they're just like, you gotta hit the bottle to let it go. <laughs> no. but, but you also I, I find that um, some of them I, I would say it's I never feel like I'm truly separating from whoever it is until the end of a run or like the end of a shoot but it's interesting how some of them by the last day by like the the, the closing of the show or the wrap uh, day you're so I'm so eager to say goodbye and then some of them I'm like please please never let me go mm -hmm. um, but I was also gonna say I think but, but for me becoming a mother really changed that to that muscle of um, uh, there is you don't the, 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 the that feeling of being present and the need of your child it was like such a great relief for me um, because uh, like we were shooting this show and it was very, I, my character was in a constant state of uh, torment and, um, but I was breastfeeding my daughter and it was like, you know, so I would be sort of being raped and beaten and covered in, and then <laughs> she had to eat and then you're with her. Yeah, you know, and, and it's it's uh, it's gone for the moment. Uh, so I think it also depends on what your life is like, or or um, what you want your life to feel like in this, you know, going in and out. Does that make any sense? I, I kind of been, yeah. I I sort of have always found it's really interesting that if I do take my character home with me, it's definitely on a very subconscious level. I feel like I. I leave it in the theater, you know, I leave it on the shoot and, and stuff. But, but you know, like you say, it's probably dancing in there. So but definitely on a conscious level, I like to sort of leave it where it's at, you know. Um, one last question, make it a good one, Michelle. Okay, so <laughs> the last question is actually my question. Um, Great, so it'll be a good one. <laughs> okay, hopefully. <laughs> uh, I I've seen you guys in all of, uh, you know, Shakespeare and stuff and, Hamish, you have a really great physical comedy. How do you make those decisions? And then how have you been able to translate that to film television work? He's doing, <laughs> he's done a bit that you've missed. He's fallen off the couch. But... <laughs> uh, uh, physical stuff. Um, uh, I don't know. You know, I, I started really enjoying, I think uh, actually the first, uh, doing Twelfth Night, uh, doing a good cheek for Dan Sullivan uh, in Twelfth Night, and really running around and falling down a lot. Um, and I think I had just just turned. I, I was I don't know, but let's not. Age is not important. But I uh, <laughs> I I was like, God, I'm so happy doing this, and uh, I was like what the hell, I should do really be happy in all of my jobs, and whether it's precious TV, film, or, or, or serious drama, whatever stuff. So uh, I just decided, I, that was like a little, I think that was a little bit of a light switch for me of just like, always be having fun, always try to be having fun and enjoying it and engaging in it. And um, often that will end, lead to uh, a good pratfall uh, or f always be sniffing out a place for pr and then I did I did do that uh, this show with Robin Williams uh, that uh, oh did I just drop that name um, <laughs> and, uh, he uh, and that was like you know we're, we're just like hungry for life hungry for laughter uh, and just always trying to like, and it would sort of, I think that stuff, uh, it's just, it's just e easier not to, 
not to try to make it hard. But Hamish is also not afraid of falling. And I mean that in every way. <laughs> Dumps off the, and when you when you show up to tech at the, at the Delacorte, the guys come out and they're so excited that Hamish is back because they know that they can like build the thing higher than is maybe code or I don't know, but he's gonna <laughs> climb it. Uh, they don't have to, you know. It's like, and then he's gonna have like a big swollen hand. Not but that was that. <laughs> But that was because we we had this theater that was in this house where there was a real balcony, and the guy who you know would climb the balcony. They just like, and they would climb the trees, and they would fall out of the trees all the time. And that was like, I mean, if you're not climbing a tree or falling off a balcony, is it really a show? So, so but how specifically to Michelle's question is. Yeah, I get that in Much Ado About Nothing and uh, and all that stuff, but is there room for that if it isn't a clowning role on TV? Is there room for that playfulness and that slapstick on TV and film? Do you, if, do you, do you find places to sneak that in? Gosh, I don't know. I mean, I think, I think there, I think... You know, I'm always I, on the brink of laughing watching you, Hamish. I don't know what that's no. all about. So. I know. You must do I so. I like a serial predator, and, <laughs> and, and I saw myself in the ADR, and I was like, oh, this is going to change things for me. And then I was like, oh, God. Oh, he's the serial predator? Oh, no, no, he was terrified. No, there's no way. Um, <laughs> but I, I don't know. You know, I just feel like acting is like spread, and especially with all this new television and all these new styles that all these people are, are working in, the new style, the spread of it, there's so much more room uh, that, you know, there's no such thing as TV acting or film. There's like, are you doing your Ryan Murphy acting? Are you doing your uh, Noah Hawley? I mean, it's like all these different auteur TV people are making all yeah. these different styles and you do all this different stuff and then, like I had this great idea for this new character I was gonna play, which is another sort of scary person. But I was like, oh, he's gonna really be doing a lot of dancing. And then I saw, oh, Joaquin Phoenix does dancing all the way through that Joker. The Joker. Thing. And I was like, oh, they, he took the, how'd they let him get away with that? Oh, they, you know, that's right. He lost 70 pounds because he did the Pilates, but then he, uh, also, he also was throwing it away. Throwing it away when the cameras roll. Throwing it away. <laughs> Michelle, did that answer your question? Because I don't I, even remember what the question there, was. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Well, guys, look, first of all, Michelle, can you unmute all our watchers and listeners to just thank these guys for giving up their time? <laughs> for, thank you so much. Hello. Hello. Thank you so much. Hello. Hello. <laughs>